Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to Hollywood After Dark, the only late night movie podcast here on YouTube worth giving a shit about. Tonight we're going to be talking about the elusive, the secretive Batgirl funeral screenings hitting the Warner Brothers lot before they allegedly burn the celluloid the movie was made on. All of that tonight and more here, Hollywood After Dark, folks, let's fucking go. Hey, what's going on, everybody? How you guys doing? Welcome to the party. Welcome to the show. Sorry, I'm a, I'm a couple minutes late, later than I wanted to be. These things happen every once in a while, especially when you have people in from out of town and you're entertaining for a couple of brief minutes. Like I said, tonight's been uh, just a hell of a day, a lot going on. Just when you think we're going to finally, finally maybe get a reprieve from all of this craziness, get back into some fun stuff. Oh, boy. The funeral hit, the funeral pyre, if you will. The last rites of Batgirl are actually taking place, supposedly. We're going to be talking about that. Also, Warner Brothers moving around, a lot of release dates. And once again, uh, bringing Affleck versus Keaton into question with this new updated trajectory. We don't quite know what's going to be happening with that. And we don't know if Aquaman will be able to take on the Star Wars, actually. That's going to be something we'll be discussing tonight. And you got a new Cassian Andor clip, as well as the trailer for Disney Plus's Pinocchio, which um, I haven't watched yet, but based upon some of the screenshots I saw, I can see why it went to Disney Plus. I know it's Zemeckis. I know it's Tom Hanks. I know it's a Disney live action remake of, of a seminal classic, but still a little bit on a little bit on the weird thing. Although Reed here does say Pinocchio trailer looks pretty awesome. So there you go on that one. Let me just check in with you guys here and see what exactly is crackalacking in the chat. Uh, let's see. Patrick says, I go to bed and watch Game of Thrones. I will tomorrow. All right. I guess I can't tell if he says he's going to watch Game of Thrones tomorrow or watch the show. Either way, uh, you're probably going to have a better time watching Game of Thrones than me. Poetic Gangsta here, a newbie to the chat, says, Notice Mr. Three Bucks is avoiding the great news of Matt Reeves signing a big contract with Warner Brothers Discovery. Hater? Actually, I talked about it last night. If you watch the show, it's all there. I talk about it. I talk about a lot of things. I cover a wide swath, a large variety of topics. It's kind of what we do here on the smorgasbord known as Hollywood After Dark. That's why uh, I talk about as much as I do, because I do try to get into some of the nitty gritty when there are nitty gritty things worth diving into. And again, tonight, like I said, we'll be talking about the Warner Brothers fiasco. And then I wanted to dive in to what I keep hearing good things about it, right? This angry Joe video about She-Hulk, because by the time we exit the episode tonight, She-Hulk episode two will be right on the horizon. And I'm curious what exactly a person with 3 million subscribers pushing back against angry, hate-fueled content when their name is Angry Joe has to say about this particular endeavor. So why don't we just uh, dive right in to a lot of the content? But we did get a uh, uh, Galia Productions right off the bat, 10 bucks. Uh, what's going on, man? It says, sup, dork. Hope you're doing great. About to produce my next film. Good. Good. That's fantastic. I think you should produce your next film. I saw your last film. I hope you learn from your last film. Uh, there are, uh, you look, I could, I have shown my earlier work. It's shitty. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, at the time when you make it, you have a vision in your head, obviously, but man, you know, 15 years later, you look at some of the stuff I produced and it's like, oof, oof. Maybe, maybe talking about movies is more your speed rather than sitting down and actually fucking making them. But no, man, listen, here's the deal, buddy. Uh, I wish you the best of luck to, to get, you always got to keep honing your craft. You always got to keep working on your craft because the more you do it, the better you get. All I want from you, non-kino, all I want from you is to just listen and try to not be Ellis from Die Hard. That's it. That's all I want is to just like take a step back, listen, learn. Don't be Ellis from Die Hard. If you've seen Die Hard, I think you know what happens to Ellis. Not to say that's going to happen to you, but uh, again, it's my fear. Moisture here for 
uh, five bucks. Thank you. Says, which Pinocchio movie do you think will do better, Zemeckis or Del Toro's? Man, I love the Del Toro trailer because I like stop motion animation. And I think Del Toro is an amazing director. Zemeckis is also one of my all time faves. That being said, I don't think necessarily recent f- recent work from him has been great. Uh, was it Welcome to Marwen? Crashed and burned pretty famously. The Witches. Uh, they pushed it to HBO Max. I know that was a Keylar move to try to bolster and embolden people to come in and buy subs uh, for the service. I get all that. But again, that one wasn't even necessarily greatly uh, received when you have the Angelica Houston original that is still remarkably monumentally creepy. And there's a lot of stuff there with all that shit I think is really, um, really worth uh, uh, checking out. But I, I don't know. I, I don't know, man. I think I'm thinking the, the Del Toro one might do better only because it's something that is new. Whereas from what I've seen out of the Disney one, it definitely has a little bit of problems. Like it just looks like it's trying to pull from the past, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. All right. Gailey here for another five bucks, man. Thank you. Says I have referring to learning, uh, but I would love to have you involved at some form. I mean, uh, I don't know what I could do. I could probably help you with, with like a story thing or whatever, or give some ideas on or whatever. Uh, But if it's, if it's your baby, if it's your story, if it's your film, I want you to make it. Don't listen to an idiot like me. Really? I mean, I'll give you my critique on things. I'll be honest. I might be a little bit blunt, which people out there don't always like, and, and I don't always like it myself, but it's something that I, be- if I, if I want to help you be better, I, I will be blunt not to be mean, but to, to try to drive home what I feel is the, uh, the, the best advice I can give. But also I feel like, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that you have to experience on your own. So thank you for that one. Really appreciate that. Uh, make Matt a star and we'll talk says Davy crouch kick Davy. I'm already a star, baby. I'm already a star. I've got a Kiwi farms thread. There's like hundreds of videos made about me over the years. I'm pretty sure I'm on the FBI's watch list for Gamergate. I'm or I, at least at some point they probably had me on a watch list and it's entirely possible. The January 6th committee has at one point heard my name. I'm saying any, th- I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm already popular enough. Let's be fair on that one there. All right. So Let's quickly take a look here at the Pinocchio trailer. We're going to start off by watching the Pinocchio trailer and, uh, and I want to see how this is. So I haven't seen this yet. If you guys have seen it, let me know, uh, how you feel when it's over, but let's dive in. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the eighth wonder of the world. I know it was real, boy. <laughs> Turn around, let me get a look at you. I will be right here when you get back. Pinocchio is running around loose without a conscience. Can you imagine the trouble he's gonna get into? Wouldn't want that on my conscience. Everybody who's anybody wants to be a somebody. But I want to be real. Why on earth would you want to be real when you can be famous? Pinocchio should have been home by now. Pinocchio! Like a bolt out of the blue. He won't be a puppet anymore. That's for sure. Selfish. You will always be my real boy. A lie can really change a person, Pinocchio. <gasps> What's happening, Jiminy? Looks like some sort of fairy magic. Kinda on the nose, if you ask me. That ain't fairy magic, that's called puberty, baby. Uh alright. Um god damn it. God damn it. God damn it. All right. That looks really good. I'm not going to lie. That's 
It's actually a really good looking trailer. Totally hit me in the feels. I, I totally feels like I, I was watching the animated movie. Yeah, only a couple days, man. Only a couple days. It's like, what, week and a half to go? I mean, the thing about that, that's a little creepy. About the release of it is like, it's a Disney Plus Day special event. September 8th, 2022. Get your Pinocchio on. And it's like, for one, Disney must not have faith in the movie if they're dumping it on Disney Plus. I think that's a reality. Remember when they launched the service three years ago and they were like, hey guys, Lady and the Tramp live action remake is on there. But a live action remake of Pinocchio starring Tom Hanks as Geppetto in an animation style that is very similar to what the original was, evoking all of those emotions from watching that 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 original film. I feel like uh, it could do well theatrically, but it also goes to show you the current state of where things are in regards to movie theaters and these kind of kids stories. Like, look. Minions 2, The Rise of Gru, uh, has done gangbusters, right? Made a lot of money. Comes out of 4K, I think you're pretty, like, what, October, I think, is when it comes out, right? So you're like, all right, cool, man. Like, that, that's coming. That's made money. But I just feel like this is, looks like a much better way, Mel, you know, I don't know. I, I can't even talk. It just, it looks good. It looks good. That's all I got to say about that. Hit me, hit me in the feels, man. Maybe I, I feel like I want to watch it. I really want to watch. I want to watch it with my kids. I think my kids will really like it. Um, God damn it. God damn it. Uh, Ryan here. Yeah. As much as I can't stand live action remakes, this looks surprisingly decent. All right. Compl I completely agree. I completely agree. Some of them have been okay. I like the Cinderella live action remake. I thought the Beauty and the Beast one was all right. I, at first, I was like a little worried Pinocchio would be like Dumbo, right? Legacy director coming in, handling one of Walt Disney Studios' earliest films. Okay, how are they going to, you know, culturally, it, it, it may not be the best, uh, but they made it work. You know, for this one, Dumbo, not so much. That one kind of crashed and burned. All right. But anyway, um, you know, let's see. Nick Winstead here says, they've been burned before, like with the live action Aladdin. It feels like Prey. So we'll do better streaming. I mean, the live action Aladdin, they put it out on Memorial Day weekend, which had famously for four years prior to that been relatively bad in regards to box office. And it ended up pulling in over a billion dollars worldwide. And I know last night, Grace Randolph, we talked about Grace Randolph and her tweet about how, you know, like, well, they started working on, you know, with the script in 2020 and blah, blah, blah. And it's all like, yeah, but Aladdin doesn't need a sequel. You know, they, Aladdin doesn't need a sequel. The Batman always could use a sequel. There's more villains to fight. Uh, Queen Danny here says uh, that it looks dumb, but the Netflix version looks better. I think the Netflix version looks good. I want to see the CGI, but man, look, if look, I, I'm I'm a I'm I'm a cynical, apathetic, somewhat nihilistic, forty year old man child. All right, I can admit that. I can acknowledge that about myself. A movie like that can can find its way to kind of come on in and make me feel pretty good. So there's I'm I'm okay with that, right? Uh Meta here says, I say the remakes are not needed, they're useless IMO. Yeah, they're useless. They're definitely money makers. But uh this one I think should have been in theaters. Moisture for five bones, buddy. Thank you. Says here, December 2023 is going to be crazy. Ghostbusters Afterlife 2, Star Trek 4, now Aquaman 2, and possibly Star Wars. I don't think Star Trek four is going to come out to be fair. It's already almost September. And as, as far as I understand it, they have not started filming it yet. So to have it ready to go by Christmas of next year is going to be a little tough. That being said, Aquaman two is basically fucking done, uh, which again, we'll talk more about that here in a couple of minutes. Star Wars hasn't even begun filming yet. How are you going to get a movie out? A year from now with like that's going to need that much special effects is going to be kind of crazy. Ghostbusters Afterlife 2 will be filming here, I think, pretty soon. And that will be a little bit easier to do, I think. So, uh, and then when, what did, I saw someone say, uh, who said it? Who said it? Someone, I saw the comment about uh, David Zaslav. Would, oh, here we go from Garrick. David Zaslav would have canceled that Pinocchio movie. Probably. Probably, right? Pro probably would have done it. Anyway, 
Uh, Garrick here for Aladdin says, just adapt the return of Jafar. We kind of talked about that last night. I love return of Jafar, the animated film. I would very much love to see them do something with it. I just want them to get a different Jafar for Aladdin. I felt like he was the weakest casting in the entire movie. Everyone else did a great job, especially Will Smith as the genie, but even Will Smith right now, post slap. There's a lot that's going on with that that I feel is going to ultimately end up hurting that kind of stuff. Speaking of qu quickly of things that I'm excited for, what we know is that they released today, a month before it comes out, a clip looking at Andor. And I want to see exactly uh, what this thing entails because I haven't watched this yet either. Let's check this one out. So which is it? I know big sass are gay. I know you bribe quartermasters to leave valuables on the ships before they come in for scrap, but this isn't that. This isn't something that let pass. No. I went in and got this myself. How? How's that possible? It was it was sealed on the Imperial Naval Base in Steergard. Look, you got the money, I got the box. What else is there to talk about? I'll give you another thousand credits to tell me how you got it. <laughs> another thousand. Done. How? You just walk in like you belong. Takes more than that, doesn't it? What, to steal from the Empire? What do you need? A uniform, some dirty hands, and an Imperial toolkit? <laughs> They're so proud of themselves. They don't even care. They're so fat and satisfied. They can't imagine it. Can't imagine what? That someone like me would ever get inside their house, walk their floors, spit in their food, take their gear. Damn, that's a good scene. That's a solid, solid scene right there. That's that's good because it's true. It's class warfare, right? The Empire, it's so true. The Empire is such a proud, a proud organization, right? They they never thought, remember, they had a small exhaust port on the, on the Death Star. They're like, ah, I don't even worry about that. Who's going to hit it? It's a one in a million shot. Some 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 moisture farmer from from the Dune Sea on Tatooine, right? Kills womp rats in his fucking free time. You think someone like that is gonna very specific characterization is gonna be able to make their way, right? In an X-wing, a, a, a ship they've never piloted before. They're gonna be able to navigate our defenses in the trench. They're gonna be able to outmaneuver Darth Vader in a in a was it a, a tie interceptor? Uh, and uh, you know, and then and then magically be able to use the force without their radar computer to be able to actually get the two photon shots into the exhaust port to take out the Death Star? It's not going to happen. It's, it's not going to happen. We're the fucking Empire, baby. We're way too we're way too meticulous for that. We're way too big for that. No one's going to come in here and fuck us. <laughs> God damn. I can't wait for fucking Andor, dude. That was I cannot wait. For fucking Andor. That was a great scene. Hell yeah. Uh, Moisture here says, uh, thoughts on Tony Gilroy saying, saying there is no fan service. Uh, dude, I'm okay with that, man. I don't think there's a lot of fan service in, uh, I mean, okay, yes, there is fan service in, in Rogue One. I can't say there's no fan service, all right? The Darth Vader scene, absolutely fucking fan service, okay? The Leia little bit at the end was was fan service-y. It, it was not great CG-wise, but it was fan service-y. But I'll say this though, man, I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm excited for this shit. I am truly, truly excited for this. I, yes, I also read today that Tony Gilroy said that the last episode or like the last couple episodes or whatever, the, 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 like the finale of Andor in season two takes place like five days before the events of Rogue One. So we're going right up to that, man, right up to Rogue One. Ah. Uh, Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. I can't, oh, I can't fucking wait. Oh, that's going to be so good, you guys. So good. Can't wait for that shit there. Uh, but, you know, but there's also, again, I see people talking in the chat here. I see Garrick here talking about how Critical Drinker says nobody cares about House of the Dragon. Then it goes on to have a massive premiere. Oh, yeah. Over 10 million people watched it. And that was linear. That was what they could record. Uh, what was actually watched is probably much, much, much fucking higher. So those guys need to really pull their head out of their panties, need to realize 100% that 
that they maybe, maybe not everybody fucking hates everything. Okay. Maybe not everybody wants to hate shit. Maybe people out there actually want to feel inspired by something that they watch. They don't want to feel anger and incredulity and apathy and, and just being disgusted at what they're told to hate. You know, these are the kind of people that sit around and they wait for something to fall for something to fail so they can kick it even further to the ground and stand over them. Like they are high and they are mighty. And like, they actually have power and fucking fucking authority over anything that gets created on this God greens earth fucking planet. I can't even talk right now when in reality, they don't make anything. They don't create anything. They are literal barnacles. They are leeches. They are carpet fit. They, they're what the uh, fucking, uh, carp, right? Bottom feeders. They, they don't actually do anything. Jeremy from geeks and gamers is, is sitting atop a 300,000 subscribed channel of pure, unmitigated, unregulated, unadulterated dog shit, because he's created an entire empire of people who all they want to do is be angry and be upset and be mad and be furious at the fact that no one will look at their penis and, and, and have, and have joy to do it. These are incel motherfuckers that all they want to do is just get mad at shit that they can't control rather than trying to actually have a life worth living with things they can control and to actually create something of value and put it into the world. They don't care about a lick of that. They don't want any of that. All they want to do is just be mad. And then you have to ask yourself why you have to ask yourself why they feel this way, why they act this way, because you know, deep down they're broken individuals, right? They're absolutely broken individuals. They, these are people who hate their mothers, who hate their fathers. There's reasons why they hate people who they believe have power over them, power over things that they enjoy because they don't want to be controlled once again, like they were when they were children. They hate women because of their uh, absolute disgust towards their own mother. That is, that is literally what's happening here, folks. That is literally what's happening here. The reason you look at someone like heel versus babyface, the guy flat out hates women. The guy fat, flat out hates women. And yet when I ask the question, people are like, he doesn't hate women. He just hates bad writing. Why is it always about women then? How's that for, for, for a fucking answer? How, how is it always about women? Why is it always about women or people of color? Why is it always people who look different than him that are always the ire? Or the, the target of his ire, of his criticism, of his hatred. Same with critical drinkers, same with nerdrotic, same with geeks and gamers, same with the quartering. If they're not white and man, then they are the problem. Now, what does that tell you about who they are as people, how they view themselves as people? They view themselves as wannabe superiors. They think that they have a, a, a weird kind of hierarchy or that they are being their hierarchy is being taken away. When in reality, they've never created a goddamn thing of value. You know, I'll give that, I'll take that back for that. I'll say that's a critical drinker. He might've written a book that sucked or 10, 11 books that sucked. If you read the reviews on Amazon, but he has still attempted to create something. So on that front, I will, I, I, I give him crops on that front. I give him credit. Eric July, I think is a complete ignorant moron, but he's at least raised the money to put out comic books that are going to be in his, in his image. Fine. Cool. If you want to create a character that uh, has a cross right over his dick for some reason, then do that. But you are at least creating something. There you go. That's really what it boils down to. All right. Uh, friendly Neighborhood Meta here says, I watched Prey today. Best decision I made this week. You were right, Matt. It's amazing. Goddamn fucking right I was. Prey was the shit. I want to watch it again. I need to watch the Comanche version of it. It was that fucking good. All right. Now, Batman Superman here makes a good point, says they think everyone thinks like them because those are the people who uh, respond to their comments. And that's true. The vast majority of people do not actually respond via comments. All right. They really don't. Like I, I read every comment that comes into this channel and I get way more views than I get comments. Even when I ask questions that like, you know, could get a response from people a lot do not comment. But the ones that do are the ones that are more invested. And when you pro, pro when you push something as being nothing but hate fueled bullshit and you speak to people who are looking for confirmation bias to push that narrative of hate fueled bullshit, that is when you get to these situations. I'm sorry. House of the Dragon was fucking awesome. She-Hulk. I watched it a couple times. Really fucking good. Super excited for tonight's episode. Hoping to see the comedy come through. Hoping that a lot of these dudes just get their fucking panties out of their fucking crotch butt and go, <laughs> crotch butt, out of their ass 
and and then actually enjoy something for once, right? Like what's going to happen when they actually start to like things? That's my question. You know what I mean? Zachary here says, I'd love to respond to their channels, but it's really not worth my time to argue with pansies that never really grew up. See, here's a problem with that, Zachary. You're right. You're right. I was thinking about this uh, 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 the other day. Okay, I really was. Uh, I say, if you go and you look at heel versus babyface or nerd erotic or even geeks and gamers, they get ratioed left and right on Twitter. They know that their audience really isn't on Twitter, that their audience is on YouTube. It's on other platforms where uh, people out there, again, they just watch without ever really engaging. They know this. So they don't care about getting ratioed on Twitter because if they do, they can then use it as cannon fodder for content, right? Look at Ryan Kinnell when Ryan Kinnell put up that clip about the his Batman review and people were like, yo, why are you being racist with this comment here? And he's like, they want me dead. And he used it as cannon fodder. They know that if they trigger you, they can turn it into a way to make money because then they can come out and play the victim. They know this. This is a, this is a social justice warrior tactic. This is very much a soy filled tactic. And these guys who always lament the left lament social justice activists lament anyone out there with a lactose intolerancy who prefers soy or perhaps even almond milk, but they act identical to them. But remember folks, it's okay. If we do it, it's not okay. If you do it, because that's the mantra they live by, but here's what you do, Zachary. And this requires a lot of people. If you ever want to ratio nerd erotic if you ever really want to take it to them you have to go to where they are you have to it would it would require hundreds if not thousands of people responding to every video that they make calling them out on their bullshit using their thumbnail style their title their description and their and their keywords because that's how you get into the algorithm that's how you match yourself with them so while their audience will watch one of their videos that are full of hatred and bigotry and misogyny and racism and misinformation, then autoplay might actually play them a response to that because the audience is showing an interest in that kind of content. And who knows who might exactly be shown that message? Someone who then goes, oh, holy shit, they're right. These guys are full of crap and they're stupid. It doesn't, inf it doesn't involve flagging anybody, which I'm not supportive of. It doesn't involve anything on like those try to deplatform people, but you can use the system against them, but it requires a lot of people. It requires an actual fucking rebellion. It requires an actual large amount of people coming together with the singular purpose of stopping the spread of disinformation and bullshit. Because right now they are unchallenged in that way on this platform. I've put out a lot of videos challenging them and they get views and comments relatively frequently from people out there who are like, I used to subscribe to them, but my God, they're so full of shit. So a lot of people have listened to messages and woken up from whatever kind of mind control fuckery that they use on people, which by the way is confirmation bias and cognitive dissonance with an impassioned approach to bad information. That's what it is. People buy your music, not your words. If you come across as angry, as you come across as, as mad as hell and you're not going to take it anymore and you place that anger onto a target, like let's say it's a left-leaning blue checkmark writer on Twitter and you constantly hammer about that person. They're the problem. They're the problem. They're what's destroying your life. They're taking your jobs. They're devaluing you as human. They're the ones that are out there making you feel this way. Then you start to teach your audience that they are the ones, quote unquote, they them, the other. What does that remind you of? What kind of propaganda does that remind you of? Who did that back in the 1930s? And what the fuck was the result of that? What we're seeing is very similar in regards to how propaganda manifests itself, how propaganda pushes itself online, how these people have been allowed to build massive platforms full of bad information, bad, bad information, not even possible, like, Decent criticism. It's just nothing but vitriolic hatred designed to keep you uneducated, ignorant, dumb, blind, head in the sand like a fucking ostrich. That's what they do. So the way to combat them is to criticize them in a way that they will not be able to silence you or get away from. Because it doesn't matter if they come out and they make a video saying people are making fun of me on YouTube. People in their audience will then go and seek that content out because they're already on. Get this, wait for it, write this one down too. Fucking YouTube. That's what it boils down to. 
That's what it boils down to. Why am I pushing political bullshit? Because it's my fucking channel and I can push political bullshit, but I'll always give you my reasoning for that. That is not just how I fucking feel, but I will at least do the fucking due diligence of diving into something. I won't make baseless claims like when neurotic is like, you know, they might put in critical race theory into Lord of the Rings. Are you fucking stupid, Gary? Are you are you hitting that fucking meth pipe again? What the fuck are you talking about? That they're going to put critical race theory in, 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 in fucking Lord of the Rings, are you dumb? Are, are you slow? Did you eat paint chips as a child? Did you live underneath uh, fucking power lines? You know, like where you dropped on your head as a baby? Like, did, did your parents like do lots of drugs when they were pregnant with you? I, I don't know. But when you, when you blatantly put in those buzzwords into content as a way to elicit a very specific and certain response from a very specific and certain audience group that you're dog whistling to, I'm going to call it the fuck out where I see it because that is disinformation. That is bad information. It's dishonesty at its like most public display. And there's a reason why these guys saunter up to fucking Alex Jones and want to just nourish at the tip of his dick. Anyway, <laughs> that was crazy. Uh, that, yeah, that was a little toss, a little, little toss there. Um, all right. So am I going to watch the good burger movie tomorrow? Oh, you're going to watch your good burger tomorrow. Okay. Timothy here says a month before Ando and they're shitting on it. Of course they are. They have to, it's all they have. Dalton here says, honestly, YouTube is kind of to blame for allowing these people to continuously feed off the system. Not even just a matter of free speech at this point. I mean, it is what it is, man. YouTube is created for a, a wide variety of commentary and a wide swath of opinions to have a space to work. The thing is, it's not illegal to spread misinformation. It's not. It's not a violation of free speech to spread propaganda. People have the right to do it. You have the right to back up your side if that's the way that you want to. But the reality of it is, is that if you disagree with that bad intel, if you see that that can lead to things like January fucking six, which makes, listen, make no mistake. All right, Jeremy Griggs, and someone will probably clip this and send this to him, but Jeremy Griggs' D-Day Cobra account 100% helped lead to January 6th by the level of disinformation that he put out there. That was until, and this, I could be wrong, but if I recall correctly, that was until Dominion started dropping those billion-dollar lawsuits, and then he all of a sudden piped the fuck down about stolen election via Dominion. Because when consequences come a-knocking, these bitches shut the fuck up. That's really what it boils down to. That's really what it boils down to. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, Music Man. Hey, what's up, Rhea? Yeah, smash the like, guys. We got 111 people watching right now. Uh, why don't we dive into something a bit uh, a bit funner to talk about? Why don't, <laughs> why don't we talk about how Warner Brothers is in bad, bad, bad shape? Uh, this is an article that came out today over on Deadline. And they say here, Aquaman 2 heads to Christmas 2023. Shazam Fury of the Gods goes to March. HBO Max House Party and Evil Dead Rise going theatrical in Warner Brothers release date changes. Now, I, for one, am glad that Evil Dead Rise is going theatrical because I love the Evil Dead franchise and I want to support it in any way that I can. I still need to play the video game. I haven't got that yet, but I do love the Evil Dead franchise quite a bit. And I want to do more with that here. Uh, real quick, Timothy Morgan says they're already crapping on Andor. Yeah, man, it's just. That's what they, it's all they got. It's all, all they got guys. It's all they got. Uh, Jay David here says house party. Yeah, dude, house party. It's not the original. It's a, it's a reboot. It's a remake of, of the original kid and play movie, which is fucking fantastic. I love that goddamn film. Um, no, it is, uh, it is not the original. It's, it is a remake of the original, but let's find out more. Although Garrick asks, have you seen Ash versus evil dead? I have, uh, I never finished it cause I, I, didn't have access to stars anymore, but I need to, I need to. Um, so, uh, is it a sequel to army of darkness or Ash versus evil dead? As far as I understand, it might be a sequel to like army of darkness or something like that, but, uh, I'll have to do a deeper dive into the property as we get closer to it. But I, I'm looking forward to a trailer whenever we get that. Cause God damn it. Like I said, I do love me some evil dead. All right. So exclusive deadline has learned that Warner brothers is making a slew of release date changes next year. 
First of all, James Wan's Aquaman in the Lost Kingdom needs more time in post-production, so it's moving from March 17th, 2023 to December 25th, 2023. <laughs> On Christmas Day, no less. You remember that the first Aquaman was released during Christmas 2018 and made 335.1 million domestic and is one of $2 billion grossing DC films alongside Todd Phillips' Joker. That is true. But let's also talk about December of 2018 when Spider-Man Into the uh, Spider-Verse came out, Mary Poppins came out, as well as Bumblebee. And yes, Aquaman went on to outperform them all, even though Into the Spider-Verse was the best movie of the bunch. And I think that um, its sequels are going to do so much fucking money. Anyway. To backfill that March 17th space and also to capitalize on an Avatar-less March, David F. Sandberg's Shazam! Fury of the Gods will be moving off his December 21st release date and heading to Aquaman 2's old date. Uh, and the thing with that is, is look, that makes sense, man. I, and I feel good. I feel better for uh, David uh, Sandberg on that one because I feel like he, he's he been getting so fucked over by this whole situation. He's been getting messed over by this whole scenario. Again, sorry if you hear my kids. They should be asleep. I don't know why they're still awake. But um, he's getting screwed over by everything, and that is unfortunate for him. That's unfortunate. So now he's coming out at a time that there is, is – is there a Marvel movie coming out around that time, December, March of 2023? Uh, the Marvels comes out around that time, doesn't it? Uh, that's definitely uh, something worth um, – you know, a wor worth coming out. Uh, well, I mean, again, it's, if it's going up against the Marvels, which I forget when the Marvels is coming out. Let me let me look that up real quick. When is the Marvels? Because I saw that they're starting the marketing for that one, right? Or they're getting ready to push that. The Marvels release date. All right, that comes out. Oh, July eighth, twenty twenty three. Okay, good. So it's not coming out. You know, a month after the Marvels or something like that, and right before fucking Endgame. So it's going to be out at a better time. It's going to be out at a better time to be able to reach a bigger audience. And I'm really hopeful. Uh, for, uh, for Shazam too, because I do love uh, Shazam 1, so I have to wait and see on that one. Also here, it says that another thing, Shazam will have access to IMAX screens on its new date, a premium ticket format that Disney will otherwise be sopping up this December with Avatar. That is true. But then again, I don't know if Shazam 2 is really going to be one that's going to be massively, you know, IMAX worthy or large premium format worthy or whatever they're going to do with it. Who knows? Now, in addition on delivering on Warner Brothers Discovery's CEO David Zaslav's promise to give movies a theatrical window, two titles originally destined for HBO Max will be opening on the big screen. Um, the uh, House Party, produced by um, by what LeBron James, um, and uh, all right, and then you've got uh, the Lee Cronin directed Evil Dead Rise opening April twenty first, twenty twenty three. The sequel's trailer played gangbusters at Cine Europe, we hear, hence another reason why it will now hit cinemas. Look, as I've said before, horror movies and will save cinema, but I'm also want to, I want to amend that now and to say that it will be horror movies and anime that will save cinema during the off months. All right. Like it will be, it, it, the, that's the whole thing. Um, you know, that's kind of the whole point with it. I think that's what, what's going to be going on here. Uh, and then also we did get uh, Jess here for two bucks says Zazlev in terms of money. We have no money. That is that is very true. Uh, there's been another little bit on that as well um, that came in from Boris Kit, which uh, sadly I, I don't uh, I don't have that particular <laughs> that particular tweet up at the moment. Uh, now, it says here that in other big releases, Warners will reignite the post Labor Day box office again in 2023 with the Nun 2 on September 8th. The first picked opened with $53.8 million in 2018, the best domestic debut for a Conjuring franchise film. The feature take on Stephen King's Salem Lot is going from April 21st, 2023 to a to-be-determined date next year. Uh, the picture is still in post. And also there is an untitled event film slated for February 10th, 2023. I don't quite know what the untitled event film will be. Or if it will be anything at all, um, who knows, right? Like, who knows? Now, Ryan says here that Warner Brothers stock dropped after all this. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, their market, we talked about their market cap the other day being uh, pretty heavily uh, tapped. And their market cap, from the looks of it, uh, went from, what, uh, $5 billion to $20 billion in loss? I mean, it's really... It's, it's really, really bad, you guys. Like, this whole thing is really... Uh, really bad for Warners. And I know eventually, I know eventually Zaslav will pretty much figure out a way to make this thing 
um, you know, to make this thing a, a kind of a reality, right? Like I, I would say that they'll find a way to make it work. They'll find a way uh, to, you know, um, to, to do it now. Hold on. I'm trying to find the, uh, the tweet here real quick. Okay. So this is a tweet that came in from uh Boris kit of the Hollywood reporter. He says here, the moves underscores what a financial mess Warner brothers discovery is as the studio has only enough cash to release two movies from now till the end of the year. Uh, don't worry, darling and black Adam. So don't worry, darling. The reason why it's so you might be asking yourself, why are they doing don't worry, darling and not doing something like, let's say Shazam two or another movie that's, that's ready to go. Cause Shazam has been ready to go for a while. Why are they pushing black Adam? Here's why. Don't worry, darling is an Olivia Wilde directed movie that is going to capitalize on the more independent success that Booksmart had a couple years ago. That movie did do pretty well on the award circuit. And they're hoping that Don't Worry Darling will be a contender for probably a lot of awards, whether it's going to be Golden Globes, uh, the, you know, the, the the SAG, the Hollywood, you know, Critics Association or whatever. I think they just had their awards too, by the way, but definitely the Oscars and they want to win Oscars and they definitely want to do it by, you know, by having, be, having the ability to highlight a female director for a best picture nod and hoping to get that nomination is definitely going to do a lot for uh, their stock and do a lot for their own, you know, ego within the system and their standing within the system. Because right now their standing is shit. Warner Brothers is in a bad place. And I know people out there want to disagree with me on that, but it's absolutely true. It's, it's just, in, it's in a terrible place. Um, and we'll be talking about that in a second too, as to like why it's in a bad place. But I do want to quickly clarify uh, one thing before talking about Black Adam. So when we talk about the bad state of affairs in regards to how they treated creatives, especially over on the animation side of things, Infinity Train comes up because there was the conversation that came out about how, uh, or I should say the accusation about pulling the residuals and how that's going to cut the creators of that show, the animators of that show, the workers on that show, their health benefits within the uh, the animation guild Okay. Turns out that's actually not accurate. So it was updated that Warner brothers is still paying into that. So they are still getting their health coverage. They are still getting those, those benefits are not being touched or not being attacked. That doesn't mean that it doesn't still suck for everyone involved with infinity train, given how it's been handled, but that is still why it was the way that it was, why it is being handled the way that it is. So, um, just to give you guys an update on that one. Now, additionally, let's talk about Black Adam real quick. So why is Black Adam not getting moved and putting Aquaman in its place? You figure that would be the better move, right? Why not? If, if Aquaman, uh, they say it's they say that they need more time for post-production. Yeah, all right, whatever. Okay, but a whole nine months, a whole nine months for post-production? What more are they adding to the movie? I don't know. But Black Adam, on the other hand, is one that is ready to go. It has been done since uh, for a month now. It's been locked. The whole thing's been finished. And they're hoping that it's going to do well. As I have said, as I have speculated, as I have very much put out there on multiple occasions, it is entirely possible that the way that this whole thing is going to play out is that Black Adam still might falter and crash. What they're hoping for is that it's going to have a very similar opening weekend to that of Venom. Venom 2 and Joker, where you've got that October release of a maybe slightly controversial, but yet high enough profile movie that's going to bring in between 50 and $90 million is what they're hoping and give the movie legs to carry it through the winter to get as much as they possibly can before Avatar comes out and then get totally trounced by the competition. I don't know what the rock is going to be able to do in that time to really be able to dive in to make selling this character to fans. Now I know there's been reports. I saw heroic Hollywood today, by the way, heroic Hollywood was absolutely, this is really funny. Heroic Hollywood was out there and they were just like, uh, you know, they've been, they've been pushing this, uh, this whole thing with Henry, you know, they, they've been saying this here, bring this up, uh, let them fight black Adam and it's the rock and it's Superman. And they, they were running a report today and they were doing everything else that they were making sure that you knew 
that there's a report out there that's coming in and and everything. And here's the funny thing about that, right? Uh, is that Heroic Hollywood is actually uh, run. He is uh, he is the founder and editor in chief of, of Heroic Hollywood. That is Umberto Gonzalez, El Mayambi. You know, the infamous film reporter for the rap that always talks shit about Zack Snyder films and is and has the ire, has the hatred, has the disgust of the Snyder Cut fandom. And his website is running a geekosity scoop from Mikey Sutton. And he's running it and they've been running it all fucking day. They've been running it all goddamn day. So I don't quite know if Henry Cavill has, in fact, filmed a cameo appearance for this movie. I don't know yet. I won't know until I see it. I don't even think I'll believe it until I see it firsthand, to be fair. But it's really funny. It is really funny to see Heroic Hollywood fall that far on that front, right? Like, they're saying, oh, it's a report from Geekosity. Like, dude, you've got inside scoops as well. Like, why don't you, if El Mayambi, if, if Umberto Gonzalez has got all these inside people, then, uh, you know, a person who actively goes to screenings, actively talks to executives, actively lives and works in L.A. versus a guy who works out of his apartment in <laughs> south of Seattle, by the way, which is where uh, Mikey lives in a, in a suburb of Seattle. You know, it's like who doesn't go anywhere near the film industry, who rarely ever leaves his fucking house. It's like, I mean, come on. It's definitely a thing there. I agree with Jay David, though. I'd say 50-50 chance he filmed the cameo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd say 50-50 chance. But here's my question, though. All right, here's my question. This is my real honest-to-God question. By the way, 138 people watching. Smack the like, you guys. Come on. Just tickle it a little bit. It will love you for it. But here's my question, though. If they've now moved... Aquaman back to December 2023. So it's now out of the way of the flash where the flash is still releasing June of 2023. Is that Ezra, is that Ben Affleck cameo still going to happen? Because Michael Keaton will be in the flash. He'll be the Batman at the end of the flash, unless they've changed things. But at the end of the flash, if Ben Affleck is lost in the multiverse, then what exactly do they need a Ben Affleck cameo for at the end of Aquaman? So are they now going to pull out that cameo that he shot that he spent one day filming on set a while back now that the release dates have changed? Think about that one. There's been no mention of that. That's a weird thing, right? And I agree with Reed here. The whole timeline is an absolute mess, right? It's an absolute mess. Who knows what the hell is going to be going on right now? So it's really, really, really funny to me to watch this whole thing play out because I don't know what's going to happen. I have my thoughts and my opinions that I could be wrong and I'm open to being wrong. But the whole thing to me is just hysterical. Now, Moisture here for two bucks says, uh, Black Adam should move away from Black Panther 2. I agree. I absolutely agree that Black Adam should move away from Black Panther 2. You know, but I will say this, though. I am glad. I am very glad that Shazam 2 is no longer the sacrificial lamb. That they're giving it its space to do what it needs to do. I am, I am happy about that. Now, Rational here says the Flash is getting reshoots too. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's one of those things where we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen with that, right? And if if they've shot a headless cameo, another headless cameo for Henry Cavill, uh, stick a fork in it. It's fucking done, man. You know. Now, Garrick here quickly asks, what do you think of Berlanti being the Kevin Feige of the DCEU? Um, I think that pulling into my garage rolling up uh, uh, all my windows, running a hose from my exhaust inside the car and then shutting the garage door would be a better fate for me personally than watching Berlanti fuck up the actual uh, film version of the DC. I think it's terrible. I think it's a terrible idea. I think the guy had ideas for how to do it on CW, but I think he uh, I think he just got lazy. I think he he tried to expand too fast. It worked a little bit. It worked for a while. But then they then they were stuck with all these shows that needed to fill 21 episodes a season when those shows should have only been 13 episodes each and had completed an arc. And then the next year, come back and did another one and they'd have a, a much better time with this stuff. Um, that is basically what's going on now. Zachary here says my gut tells me Henry Cavill is possible. We'll, we'll move to Marvel, essentially. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. 
if he'll move to Marvel. I know that there are uh, those rumors about him being Hyperion in season two of Loki. And I, I don't know if he would want to like, you know, if, if he would want to do that. I don't know if he would want to run both, especially if Hyperion is like an evil Superman-esque type character. It just seems a little, you know, on the nose, if you will, a little on the nose, like really on the nose. Uh, saying when X here, it says, uh, people didn't understand why cancel Batgirl is still going with the flash or why they canceled Batgirl, but are still going with the flash after all the problems with Ezra Miller. Well, the thing is, is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. I think. Right. But I, like Ezra, Ezra's in a situation. Like I said, this to RJ last night, we like an underdog. We do. We like an underdog. And by having the underdog come out now, by having Ezra come out and say, I'm sorry, I'm having a complex mental health issues. I'm getting the help that I need, yada, 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 yada. You can tell that like a lot of people are like, okay, cool. Ezra said something great, perfect, awesome, amazing. We can just move on now. And, and now Ezra's got the redemption arc angle going on. So if they show Ezra getting help or doing like, you know, community service work or whatever photo op type shit, it will help to re rehabilitate the image in the general, you know, the general movie going community. But again, if this stuff blows up, if there's relapses or things like that, I don't know what's going to happen. I really, really have no idea what's going to happen there. Um, we'll have to uh, just to kind of wait and see on uh, on that one there. Uh, but all right, why don't we talk about the the big news of the night? And that, of course, is secret Batgirl funeral screenings hit the way oh, hit the Warner Brothers lot. Hold on. Let me um. Let me refresh this here. Uh, there we go. I had I had kind of falsified the title for the thumbnail. Uh, I had to refresh it real quick. So anyway, secret Batgirl screenings hit the Warner Brothers lot exclusive. The canceled DC film is getting funeral screenings before the footage is being put under lock and key. Supposedly, supposedly saying here, Batgirl won't be flying onto HBO Max screens, but a select group of insiders is getting to see the film during secret screenings on the Warner Brothers lot this week. Multiple sources tell The Hollywood Reporter. They are said to be for people who worked on the movie, both cast and crew, as well as representatives and executives. One source described them as funeral screenings held before the film is sent off to an undisclosed afterlife with footage locked away in a vault, either physical or digital. Um, like that is, That's nuts. Uh, that is nuts. So, so this is what, you know, so he, this thing here, right, is could they bring the film back? Right. That's the question. That's the question everyone's asking. Could they hashtag release back girl? Could it happen down the road sometimes? Uh, I don't think so. One question swirling around Batgirl is whether it could become the next Zack Snyder's Justice League, an abandoned film that later sees the light of day. But Batgirl is different for multiple reasons. Uh, Justice League was not a tax write down for the studio. It was just a fucking loss. It was released in theaters and there were no legal reason an alternate version could not exist down the road. If the studio were to release Batgirl, it would run afoul of the rules that allow Warner Brothers Discovery to claim a tax write down. Now, what you got to remember also is the current rumor around this is that Warner Brothers Discovery will only receive a 15 to 20 million dollar estimated tax credit for writing down this 90 million dollar movie. I feel that like if they put some more money into it, which as we've been learning, they simply do not have the money. The, the studio is straight up cash poor. They, you know, they could probably make that money and do whatever with it, but I don't know. Now, what's more here is the filmmakers say they do not personally have access to any footage, though sources say it's possible some players connected to the project may have footage on personal drives. In contrast, when Snyder left the Justice League in spring of 2017, he departed the Warner's lot with a laptop containing a rough four hour cut of the film, one he would later complete after a years long campaign from fans demanding to see his version. Uh, well, it should say here after a years long uh, campaign that he led demand uh, to get prompting fans to demand the uh, the version. Now, generally, a studio would not get the full tax write down immediately on money losing project, but rather get a certain percentage right away and the rest over a period of years. That's because it's unclear how much a project might make or lose over its lifetime as it hits cable and other platforms. Okay. So, but this is where it gets nuts. This is where it gets fucking nuts. 
Several sources suggested that Warners might make the drastic move of actually destroying its Batgirl footage as a way to demonstrate to the IRS that there will never be any revenue from the project, and thus it should be entitled to the full write-down immediately. Other sources despite dispute this notion, noting that there are other projects that still have footage locked away that will never see the light of day, such as HBO's first Game of Thrones spinoff pilot, Blood Moon, an hour of television that not even author George R.R. R. Martin has seen. There are also the possibilities that Warners could, down the road, decide Batgirl is worth releasing and pay back the government its tax liability. Now, that is fucking fascinating. If they are able to, if they are absolutely positively able to, down the road, pay back the government 15 to $20 million in order to get this movie back up there, that would be something. But I'm still super confused by the whole concept of it. You know what I mean? Like, it's such a weird thing. It's like, fine, if you want to write it down now in order to save those $3 billion, which is effectively what they're attempting to do, right? Because that's what they are. They're trying to effectively save those, those $3 billion. Then down the road, if they become profitable, then they might pay back the government as a way to release it. I mean, look, to finish the movie, to finish the fucking movie, you'd have to have the directors come back in. Uh, you know, you'd have to have the, you know, VFX artists uh, continue to work on it. The editors come back in. I think it was at Natalie Holt who did the, uh, the composure or did the composing, the musical score. I think she did most of it, if not all of it, but she'd have to come back in to finish it. You'd have to get Leslie Grace to want to come back in to work on it. I mean, it's like this whole thing is a fiasco that has, in my mind, irreparably damaged Warner Brothers Discovery in perpetuity. I don't think they'll ever fully recover from this. I really don't. But I also have to ask the question from just a business perspective, not one fueled by emotion on the issue. Is it just worth it for them right now to take that hit and then just be done with it? Take the hit now, let everyone be mad and move on. That might be the easier way about it. And that might have even been the easier way about it a, a month ago when this whole shit went down. But how they treated, how they responded, how they acted in regards to Infinity Train and other Cartoon Network shows and Adult Swim shows and uh, the gutting of their whole family, you know, uh, content side of things, getting rid of the HBO documentary side of things. I mean, how they've handled uh, the ability, to, you know, laying off what, like a few hundred people or whatever. And I get it. This is all business related stuff. This is all business related moves. But the way they did it was so callous and so careless and so destructive to the narrative that I don't think they're actually going to be able to come back and really be able to figure it out. It is just, it is just crazy. It is just, uh, it's yeah. Ryan here uh, says it best. Um, it is. Yeah. They've handled it poorly. Now Reed here was asking me, uh, Oh no. Meadow was asking me if I saw the, uh, the, the filmmakers talk about that. I did. And uh, here is that footage. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Adil. I'm Bilal. And we're the directors of Image, Black, Gangster, Snowfall, the pilot, Miss Marvel, the pilot in the finale, Soil, Bad Boys for Life, and Batgirl. So we wanted to explain actually the day that we found out about the bad girl getting canceled. So we were at Adil's wedding. Congratulations, bro. Thank you. Thank you. It was beautiful. It was Morocco. Thank God that my beautiful superhero wife uh, was there with me to support me through these times. So. I was in Tetuan. I was visiting the grave of my grandfather and grandmother. And when I was leaving, um, I picked up my phone and I saw there was a lot of messages. I got a call and they said to me, bad girl is done. Yeah, I was in Tangiers in a hotel honeymooning with my wife and all of a sudden I got a phone call. Meanwhile, I was getting messages and they said they're going to kill the movie. And when I heard that, I was shocked because I, I didn't even realize that was a possibility. It was as if we were doing movie history right there. And I called right away Martin Walsh, the editor, and said, yo, you got to pack up that shit, you know, back up, copy the movie. And then they called me and I said, yo, yo, shoot it on your phone. So I went on the server and everything was blocked. Yeah, I apologize. That's not the right thing to do, but I was panicking, you know. Yeah, it was, it was an emotional just, reaction. It was emotional. It's not good. It's not good to do piracy. But, you know, it was just, what do we do? What do you do? And to see that the movie was gone, that we didn't have any access to the footage, or able to see it for ourselves again, that was pretty, pretty harsh. It was painful. I was emotional. It was shocking. And certainly for the, our crew and 
cast were, we were like a family. It was intense. We were passionate to make this movie. Really, they gave the best of themselves. And the movie was not even done. I mean, there was still a long way to go. It was a lot of work to be done. Same thing that happened with Miss Marvel and Bad Boys for Life. It was just, we were just starting to really get somewhere with the post-production. And there was no VFX. So there were scenes that were missing reshoots. And we got a lot of support from everybody in the world, which really meant a lot to us. That, that's the, the thing that kept us uh, our head straight. And a lot of people ask us, how can they support us? And our answer is actually, you can support us by watching our movie. Our movie is called Rebel. That's a movie we shot last year and we finished it this year, premiered at the Cannes Film Festival. Rebel is our most personal and most important movie we ever made. And it's about something true, about the, the civil war in Syria, about ISIS, about radicalization, and, and follows really a family. We put everything in that movie. Uh, we're so happy and so grateful that... All right, so, uh, you know, it's... um. Man, I didn't even realize that uh, that was <laughs> that shit. You know, I love it. Like, oh, it's like, shoot it with your phone. Ah, piracy's bad. Not, no, 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 not in this case. I think everyone can kind of go like, no, nah, that's fine. Wow. Uh, I hate to say it, Spherical Man, but I think this is the most astute point on this particular subject that anyone can make by saying here, uh, Zach effed things up for these guys by stealing the Justice League footage. Um, yeah, he did. I, I think, I think, uh, and this is maybe one of the reasons why Zack Snyder hasn't said anything publicly. I don't know if he's reached out privately. I would hope that he has, uh, but at the same time, his actions have, have very much hurt, uh, these guys, uh, you know, un, 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 un uninitiated. It wasn't intentional or unintentionally hurt them, but still. And this is part of the problem that comes with this stuff is like, these guys are t doing this stuff personally. They, this is a movie that they want to make. They were, you know, I, I thought they proved themselves uh, to the general audiences with not only Miss Marvel, but with bad boys for life. I mean, these guys were clearly going to be uh, big commercial directors. They're going to still be doing big blockbusters. Kevin Feige is going to toss them a movie guaranteed to capitalize on this a hundred percent. Cause it's a smart move, by the way, business wise, it's a smart move. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of ridiculous. It, it's really, really goddamn ridiculous. Now here's the thing with this, right? Um, here's the thing with this. I think right now the popularity surrounding Batgirl is so high that it would be worth the studio, uh, worth it to the studio to just not do the tax write down or pay back the money or whatever, finish it, release it theatrically. People will come out in droves to go see it. You will not be able to like get people away from seeing this movie. This is a movie that was canceled. This is the movie that was in the potentially going to literally physically be burned, be cremated, be destroyed, be buried so it couldn't be revived as a way to prove to the United States government that they weren't going to try to profit off this film. And it's it's like, again, America, society at large, man, they fucking love an underdog story, man. They love an underdog story. They want to totally come back and do this shit. That's absolutely what they should do is they should find a way to make this thing work now because you can't beat this kind of press. Because here's the thing. It's like, look at Sonic. They release that trailer. Everyone loses their shit. This is bad. This is bad. This is bad. It doesn't matter if the movie was good. This is bad. They decide to go and fix it. And it looks good. And guess what? The movie itself was really good. And the movie would have been really good as, as functionally as it was without that comics that are, you know, if it still had that original Sonic design, but because that was so terrible, people would have not gone and seen it. It would have, it would have flopped. But this is something that people out there would flock to go see. They would rush to go see it. And if theaters are at a time when they need to get revived, man, fuck, dude. I'm not saying it's going to make a billion, but it definitely would turn a profit. Uh, Rationally for five bucks says uh, they should have replaced Keaton with Affleck and reshoots and relapsed Batgirl or and relapsed Batgirl theaters. Uh, it would have uh, made at least 650 million. Again, I, I think I, I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you. I do think that they probably would have done better had they actually had, you know, Ben Affleck back instead of Keaton. But again, what we don't, what we don't realize is just essentially uh, how this shit is going to play out 
you know, like beforehand with the previous regime. But again, Zaslav doesn't seem interested in all at all for trying to build talent relations. At least that's not what I see from it. So uh, I didn't know. I didn't say that Mo eat shit. I didn't say it's going to make a billion. I said, I don't think it's going to make a billion. Um, but I definitely would, uh, I, you know, I'm hoping what I'm hopeful for now, and I'll just say it. I'm, I'm hopeful that during these quote unquote funeral screenings, somebody, uh, bootlegs it and releases it. Fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it. And fuck them. Uh, crime Corgi here says, let's be real. The Batgirl movie was supposed to set up Batgirl replacing Keaton's Batman. The script was bad. Costume design is bad. JK Simmons Gordon doesn't make sense with Keaton. Again, it's the multiverse buddy. It's the multiverse. It's something I've been actively against, but I still want to see the movie. You know, uh, Paul here says, I still wonder if Batman is back uh, or if Affleck is back. I don't know. I don't know, man. With again, like I said, with the moving of the flash, uh, the moving of Aquaman past the flash, having the Keaton cameo restored just seems like the best course of action because that was already the intent. Batman Superman here says we need Batgirl now more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. And we're I mean, wh- here's my question. Why? Why isn't uh you know, if the, if the, if the DC EU fam, you know, if they're so tight, where, where's uh Gal Gadot saying anything? Where's Momoa saying anything? Where's, uh, where's Ben? Where's Henry? Where's Zach? Where's Ray? Why isn't Ray said anything yet? Oh, that's right. Cause he won't. Uh, I did want to laugh at this, by the way, quick thing I saw today. I saw this on Reddit, apparently going around, uh, for September 4th, they want to do a hashtag campaign for bring back Ray Fisher cyborg. You know, here's, here's all these times here, right? Let's come together to show our love and support for Ray Fisher on the anniversary of Hamada's failed hit piece against him. Jesus Christ, the cope, the fucking cope of these people is hysterical to me. All right. It, Ray Fisher ain't coming back, dude. You don't shit on the studio that much. Yeah. Wh- where is Ezra Miller? I don't know. I don't know where Ezra Miller is. No one knows where Ezra Miller is. We don't know what's going on. Ah. <sighs> It's all something, guys. It's all something. It's all terrible shit. It's all terrible shit. But all right, let's get into the final piece. This might take a little bit of time to get through. Um, it is, of course, the Angry Joe. People are pissed that we didn't hate She-Hulk. And there's a lot of controversy controversy surrounding She-Hulk and surrounding, you know, the fact that people out there, I, th- I don't think understood. Truly, I don't think people understood what they were going for with the episode. I really feel like they were, again, primed to hate it found any little thing to nitpick, failed to actually see the overall story that it was starting to set up and go from there. But let's see what Angry Joe here has to say, because I keep hearing this is a really good video. And uh, I just saw the fucking reaction to my She-Hulk uh, video. And I'm taking the bulk of the blame on this. Everybody says that Alex is right and I'm wrong, which is weird because Alex gave it a 7 out of 10 and I gave it a 7 out of 10. But I understand it's my show, and Joe gave it a 5 out of 10, so you're probably more in line with what Joe said. I get it, it's my show, so I'll get the most of the flack on this. People are calling me sellouts. They say, if Joe doesn't give this a 0 out of 10, then he is afraid of being canceled, uh, calling my integrity into question, and really just attacking the channel. And, uh, you know... I'm really surprised by the reaction. I think the the biggest thing that I said that was wrong was that I don't care about power levels. Um, Comparisons. They said, Joe, you would be pissed if Wonder Woman was stronger than Superman or shown to be as strong as Superman. It's one example. Another example is, oh, Joe, you're a fucking lying sellout. Uh, You would totally care if they showed Supergirl poning Superman over and over or shown to be as strong as Superman. And I thought about that. And I said, you know what? I actually don't care if Wonder Woman is shown at times to be as strong as Superman. It doesn't bother me like it bothers you or it hurts your ego so much. Notice how he says there at times. I, I agree with him up to this point, by the way. I do agree with him up to this point. It's like, but at times. But you can't sit there and say that you don't care about power level. And like, well, I'm okay with them sometimes being stronger than it's, I get what he's trying to get to here. I I think the older you get a lot of the shit, like it's just the less you kind of care about a lot of this stuff, but I'm agreeing with them so far. I really am. If they show Supergirl getting 
a bunch of good punches in on Superman actually hurting him, I would say that's in character and that's part of her power level. And I wouldn't give the show a zero out of 10 if in a training sequence she gets good hits on an Hulk. But that's what you've done here. As you've said that because She-Hulk can take Smart Hulk. See, that's the thing. I did not clarify what I meant. I wasn't talking about Hulk because Hulk as we know him no longer exists right now. It's Smart Hulk. That It's crazy. Like, okay, but let's look. I get it. I totally get it. I find talking down to men constantly fucking annoying. I do. I get that some of you's whole identity is anti-woke, and if there's something fucking woke, it deserves to be a negative 1 out of 10 on your scale. I totally understand that from an outside perspective, but the culture war doesn't matter that much to me. I get it. it <laughs> He's not wrong on that one. He's not wrong on that one. It really isn't. Like The culture war itself is ultimately uh, a manufactured event, right? It really is. It's very manufactured in many ways. Now, they say that politics is downstream from culture, and I think a lot of people tend to kind of live in that half space, the ones that like on both sides that are trying to argue that either certain things have too much representation or certain things have don't have enough representation. And they try to make mountains out of these molehills. But he's right. The culture war at the end of the day doesn't really matter. It hasn't destroyed your fucking life, right? You can choose to not watch something. Probably like the most damage you could do to something would be to not watch it which means no engagement, which means if no one watches it, they cancel it. And then they move on to something else that might make more money or might make more sense. But because people didn't ever think critically like that, like when I was ranting earlier about the fandom menace and how to call them out directly, that is outright using your platform as a way to come together to, to coalesce against these kind of bad players, bad faith actors. Uh, you know, but again, these bad faith actors by constantly attacking this shit are, are still driving people to it. They're not, they're not hurting the numbers. People are still watching because they still want to see what exactly these assholes are going to say about it, both on, on their side and on the opposite side, you know, and I, and I watch some of their content occasionally like on here, we'll react with the Chud watch. But again, it's a lot of the times it's the same shit over and over and over again, very little critical approach to anything and a lot of it is just grandstanding and politicking but let's keep going if it starts to ruin my favorite things i'm totally with you i hated it when it was in star wars we had admiral gender studies literally talking down to poe at with the worst fucking plan this this ray mary sue character who never really earned anything and 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 in this new disney star wars that never really had a direction i agree with all that and i get it okay so listen i have always criticized the last jedi i will never not criticize the last jedi but to call admiral hodo Ad, Ad, admiral sjw or admiral gender studies i do think undervalues and undercuts what the character was attempting to do all right, because the character knew who Poe was and the character knew what Poe could do and knew that Leia trusted Poe and Admiral Holdo knew all of these things, but also knew that Poe was impulsive and didn't want Poe to do anything that was remarkably that was going to put them in jeopardy because that is kind of what Poe does. Poe will just do things. And in that moment, they needed a strong, steady hand and not impulsive response. That was ultimately what happened with that. That is kind of the whole point. But because Admiral Holdo had said, oh, I've known flyboys like you, I'm paraphrasing. Then people like Joe here, oh, that was Admiral Gender Studies. It's a bit dismissive of the character arc, even if you don't like the character, which I'm not a big fan of. You can look at what the character is doing and understand that. And I'll say this. Ray, Ray. In The Last Jedi was definitely more of a Mary Sue than she was in The Force Awakens. Ryan uh, Johnson neutered the characterizations from that. He didn't want to write all of these different characters. He just wanted to write like two of them. And that's why Finn went to shit. 
and, and Rostico, obviously, but because uh, her character was just not well written, nothing against Kelly Marie Tran. But again, I think that in this particular regard, Joe is, he's like, you know, uh, he's wrong kind of in the sense and he's still kind of backing up their talking points. I'm sorry. It's like, but he says here, if it, if it, if it, it doesn't impact me, then it doesn't matter. But he says star Wars impacts me, but she Hulk doesn't. It's like, it's kind of a roundabout way of talking about it. And it's a little, it's a little uh, coming out of both sides of his mouth, but you know, maybe he'll clarify his points. Cause we're only three minutes in. I understand. But even those pieces of media i didn't give a zero out of ten so for you to walk in here and say that i'm lying i'm deceitful i'm uncritical if i don't give she hulk a zero out of ten i'm afraid of being canceled you guys have gone way too fucking far a segment of you i'm not talking to all of you i'm talking to a segment of you that gets riled up that watch that complains about my 40 minute videos while watching a 45 minute angry rant about episode one, an hour long rant about episode one and how it's man hating. Then you come and complain that my video is 40 minutes when we don't we talk about other things besides the swipes at men. But let's talk about the swipes at men. OK, it's mainly, I think, what really triggered so many dudes was this scene right here. Bruce, I'm great at controlling my anger. Mm. I do it all the time. When I'm catcalled in the street, when incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me, I do it pretty much every day because if I don't, I will get called emotional or difficult or might just literally get murdered. So I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. So all of this just feels like projecting a lot of shit onto me. See, the problem with that scene is she goes too far and takes a swipe at Bruce, saying infinitely more than you, while disregarding all of Bruce's experiences. And it simultaneously triggered every single MRA member, men's rights activist, yeah. All right, all right. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I know a lot of the MRAs, the old school MRAs, okay? Like I'm literally sitting right here next to a signed copy of the Red Pill, a feminist journey into the men's rights movement by Cassie J, who uh this was given to me by one of the producers of the film. I've known Cassie. We've been friends on Facebook since 2010. And, uh, and her journey from going from a feminist into the MRA movement to understand the MRA movement is one that, again, oftentimes in these scenarios gets absolutely, absolutely over. Like, this gets totally, again, a ton of misinformation about that shit. Uh, you look it up if you can. Watch it if you can. It's like a documentary. But to say that it triggered these guys, geeks and gamers, nerdrotic, heel versus babyface, they're not men's rights activists. They're not. They're not. They're not even in the same fucking ballpark. Again, it's just a generalization of what that movement actually is. And there are a lot of bad eggs in that movement. But again, I know a lot of the people who are at the top of the online MRA movement and they're very nice and they're very kind and they have very specific desires that they want to see changed. But Joe here is just generalizing this shit because that's all Joe can fucking do. Sorry, like, I'm sorry. Joe has never been a super critical guy for me. He's like, remember the throwing $7 at the fucking screen and shit, right? Like, he's trying to be rational here. But again, he's just, he's just, he's using talking points that I don't think he understands what he's saying. But all right. Collectively exploded at once. Because I think they think the show was supporting her point of view. When I think the point of the scene was that she says she could control her anger so much better than Hulk, simultaneously losing it, becoming too angry, and turning in to She-Hulk, thus proving everything that she just said was bullshit. Okay? Now, I don't He is right there. He is right there. You can't allow women to say, hey, catcalling sucks. It makes me angry. Hey, giving uh, being mansplained my own position and, and, and having my ideas taken by men or whatever pisses me off. Having the possibility of being killed and raped in an alley or being fearful of that sucks. So this show looks just 
garbage. I, I will be honest with you. I'm sorry. Is, is you lecturing in the most tendentious fashion about how hard women have it in the United States in the middle of a comic book show? Is that, is that hugely important? Why does saying that piss off men so fucking much? And say women are so victimized, they're constantly having to hold back in the face of male aggression. And, then, and, and, it's, and it's, it needs to be promoted to teenage boys who are watching She-Hulk. Infinitely more than you. Again, tying into, I'm better than you. A woman screaming at your face, I'm better than you. Because I'm better than you? You're not an incel. You don't hate women. So if we're just talking about like who gets killed in the United States, like in terms of homicide victims, I'm going to note that men get killed way more often than women. Part of this scene is her being an asshole, ignorant, a bit of a bitch. Is she, is she putting truths in there? Yes, there are some truths in there. Is she right? No, she's wrong. And I hope the show realizes that. And I hope that's the idea of the show is. Well, remember, they're cousins and they're talking shit to one another. Because remember, like right after, like I think right before that, he's all like, Is it, am I jealous? Is this what jealousy feels like? Like, what the hell? You know, which is meant to be, again, it's a bit of a joke. They're, you know, Bruce is playing it up. It's a comedy show. There's going to be exaggerated behaviors for the sake of humor. But these humorless virgins don't know what comedy is. And they think that by just running, you know, their, their, their cancer holes, which is their mouths, that they think that they understand how to tell a joke. They understand timing and they understand, they don't understand anything because as I pointed out before, they don't actually create anything outside of just bullshit. That's all they can do. I was conveying if it's not, and we see that in episode two and three and four and five, fine. You got me. But I think this particular scene really fucking bothered men. Some type of men. You want to create an opening for market competition so that we here at Daily Wire can make kids content and take away some of your market share? I'm happy to do it. I mean, I'm fine with it. So, by the way, that's his entire play here. Okay. Like, like really. Shapiro wants to take on Disney+. Plus. He wants to take on Netflix. He wants to take on everything. And he thinks that, by the way, that, like, movies like Run, Hide, Fight and movies like Terror on the Prairie are going to be what does it when he I think what he realizes he can't market those movies directly to mainstream audiences because I don't know they're not like they kind of suck you can't really market a movie about a girl surviving a school shooting to a mainstream audience not right now and then Gina Carano's movie it could it could have actually gone out there and done I would say okay because the movie itself didn't have a message associated with it at all uh, it was just a, a simple little thriller. It was like a lower budget thriller movie that could have easily recouped its costs in theaters. But they they want to create kids content that's anti woke. They want to create kids content. That, like, what does that even mean, dude? Like, like children soak up everything that they see. You know, like what are you gonna do? You're just gonna do straightforward children's content without a political message? Fine, good, do that. But you're not. But you're going to market it to people who are outright looking for a right framed political message in their content because they go to the Daily Wire in order to get their right heavily right skewing material from people like four foot eleven Ben Shapiro, you know, like from people like Matt Walsh who create content that's basically always marginalizing and bashing on trans people. Like that is what they go there for. They go there to get misinformed. They go there in order to get triggered. They go there in order to get angry. And that is how the Daily Wire is able to maintain a level of control over their idiotic, mouth-breathing, troglodytic, knuckle-dragging audience. That is just how it goes. Now, I'll, and I'll be fair, people go to places like the Huffington Post and Jezebel and the Mary Sue for the literal same content, but on the other fucking side. It does go both ways. But Huffington Post, Mary Sue and Jezebel aren't trying to create children's based content in order to, you know, manipulate and, uh, kind of, uh, what's the word I want to, uh, you know, groom children essentially, which is what they want to do. Let, let's go. Makes me more money. Makes me more money. Makes me more money. Oh, I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. She was being self-absorbed. She was being ignorant of what other people have been through. She was 
attacking Bruce. You know, when you're when you're going off, when you're self-righteous and you don't realize what you sound like. I think that that's, I'm hoping. I don't know anything about being one. self-righteous and, and not knowing what that she has a like. art to go on, <laughs> that she's going to learn so much from that. Now, it's possible that, no, that's not the way it was. That's the way I saw it, though. And that's how I called it. And that's how I reviewed it. It didn't hurt me and my ego down to the core where I was like, nope, zero out of ten, this show hates all men. About how hard women have it in the United States in the middle of a comic book show, is that is that hugely important? Homicide victims? I'm gonna note that men get killed way more often than women. They literally want every single man in the world to drop dead and die. Men's rights activists, rise up! Stop this show! But we have to keep pushing, is the idea that women are victims in the United States. They're part of the victim coalition here in the United States, and you have to hear it from She-Hulk. Ben Shapiro is not a men's rights activist. In fact, if you were to ask Ben Shapiro his his... Uh, thoughts and opinions on MRAs, he would not speak highly of them. Like that just, that bothers me. That just, that bothers me because it's, 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 I get the point Joe is trying to make, but it is, it is illogical and it is not well researched. She Hulk will tell you about it. It's, vi it's so important guys. I mean, I'm fine with it. Makes me more money. Makes me more money. Mm, that was smoke. I'm going to read this for you. After realizing who Joe is, I encourage everyone to rewatch his commentary on recent controversial shows. You will notice his rating methods are based on self-denial, ignorance, feigned interests, excuses, naive optimism, and promotions for the leftist <laughs> agenda, where he approaches the realization of irredeemable status of this show. It's an irredeemable show, guys. At the end of it, all he's left with were trying to rationalize his uncritical, deceitful, insulting, biased decision-making. Because I gave, all because I gave She-Hulk a 7 out of 10. Alex is so much right, I just want to watch Alex talk about it. He gave it a 7 out of 10. You guys are talking out of your ass. We who have noticed and made it known does, don't need to fear the undermining of integrity or baseless accusations that follow because it never changes the reality of what has happened, does happen, and will happen as such is the benefit of clarity that comes from valuing the right principles. <sighs> Gobbledygook nonsense fucking nonsense if you want to unsubscribe from the channel because i didn't give she hulk episode one a zero out of ten or a rating much much lower then do it we don't need you here if i lost one million subscribers over this over a differing opinion i would still be able to sleep at night because a woman screamed at you and you were like, how dare you? I agree. You? He does and look burned taking out. taking it out on the show. You're saying, and, and if you look at this, you bros rate woke content like the majority of IGN reviews. <laughs> okay, that's pretty I funny. Really, I, I mean, I got to be honest with you. I really just don't care that much about the woke, anti-woke culture. It doesn't matter that much to me. If there's a few swipes at men from a female director, a female writer, I don't immediately shut down and get my panties in a bunch and start screaming bloody murder and make a 45-minute angry rant video over it. Some people do, and I get it. That's their thing. Look, I'm called Angry Joe. If somebody is ripping us off in a video game, I'll make an hour-long rant and I'll get my panties in a bunch. That's my passion. If your passion is, you, you know, you, you you know, men are getting insulted and, and men have feelings too, go at it. That's great, man. That's wonderful for you. And there's a whole subcosm and microcosm and revenue generation stream on YouTube and, 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 and personalities that you can listen to and let them rile you up. But man, like looking at those uh, titles and those videos, I mean, you can obviously see the usual suspects here. It's not hard to, to pinpoint who they are because, you know, the shit does unfortunately rise to the top. But still, 
it's interesting to look at that and to go like, yeah, these guys have made, you know, they make money by being furious at women. They make money by being really upset over things they actually have no uh, fucking idea, uh, uh, you know, idea about. Now, I do agree that he does look tired. I do agree that Marvel Maniac here, RJ says, I think he's tired of YouTube's BS. I mean, we all are, you know, they all, we, we really all are. I, I uh, like it's just nuts and shit. You know, I am. Um, I, I honestly I don't think much about YouTube anymore myself. I think more about doing like YouTube shorts or, or TikToks or whatever, because I feel like there's more growth there and more fun over there than it is. Now, I love doing this. I'm not going to stop. But it, it, it's like, again, doing like the stuff that Angry Joe does, pumping out these like 45 minute long ranty reviews of these shows. I don't know. Like, I, I haven't done a review of a show in a while. I need to do more movie reviews. People seem to like those. But I'd rather you know, maybe dive into a movie chapter by chapter and talk about it that way and have a bit more fun, something a bit more in depth versus just like, you know, top of my head ranting about shit. I don't know. I just, that's where I'm at with it. I've talked about this before, uh, quite often, but still, uh, look, I'm agreeing with Joe for the most part, but I get, I get the frustration. I get the frustration. I get being tired, but let's keep moving. You know, it's honestly starting to turn into, if anything has a female lead, then it's slanted yep. and and pe certain people are going to hate it. Certain people are going to pick at it. Certain people are going to blow things up. It's getting crazy, man. It's getting ridiculous. And I I'm not a part of that. You know what I mean? I'll call it out when I see it. Like, look, when I see a bad character like Ray, right? I think Ray from Star Wars is a bad character. I think Admiral General Studies from Star Wars is, is a bad character, an annoying character. And I get it. This episode from She-Hulk, she was so annoying. She was abrasive. She was, you know, she really hurt your feelings. <laughs> I I get it. And I I just think that's a part of her character arc. And I've seen people act that way before. And I've seen people grow into better people from that before. But when you're depicting that, that type of person and then you immediately give it a zero out of 10 because of the type of person that she is i mean i think that's going a little bit too far if you want to say look it's a boring ass show that's fine like i totally agree with you i could totally see you saying that but to say that the entire show is about men suck and women are flawless i think you're missing the point i don't think that that's what it's saying there's a few swipes at men. I have been analyzing your blood, and the way it synthesized gamma, I, I was able to use it to completely heal my arm. Oh, because I'm better than you? Mm, it's just basically different. In a better way. There's a few female perspective things and looking at things from a female perspective, but that doesn't mean that females are flawless. You with anyone? I'm waiting for my ride. What's your name? I think my boyfriend's just... Oh, gone. come on. Where are you going? Let us keep you <laughs> hey, company. Hey, we're just being friendly. <laughs> yeah, where are you going? So, uh, what? You too good to talk to us? So, so I have seen this scene criticized. And when they criticize this scene, they're like, those guys weren't like, you know, they were just talking to her. Like, what's the problem? What's the big deal? Why she got to walk away? Like, literally, she's like, I, you know, like, okay, I don't want to talk to you. I'm waiting for my ride here. And they're like, oh, hey, what's your name? What's going on? How you doing? And she's like, I'm clearly done with the conversation. And they're like, no, 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 we're going to keep following you. I, I've seen people criticize. Yeah, I've seen the criticism, the criticism say, well, oh, all men, the show, all men in the show are bad. Uh, you know, these guys are shown to be following her when she clearly is uninterested, which hey, I hate that. I hate to break it to all of you who never leave your mother's basement. This can happen. In fact, I cover true crime. I do. I cover a lot of true crime. I read a lot of stories about women who are beaten to death by their partners or women who have been stalked back to their home and beaten and murdered by people who wanted them but couldn't have them. I read about this shit all the fucking time because guess what? It is a reality that does happen to a lot of women on this planet filled with over 8 billion fucking people. So why don't you stop making it all about you? Stop thinking that every little time there's a bad male character on the screen is making you out to be a pimple dicked loser because that's what you're acting like. Like, wait a minute here. Hold on. Bad characters. No, that can't be. I'm not a bad guy. Well, if you're not a bad guy, don't get mad at what happens to bad characters. How about that? How about that? That's, that's pretty fucking basic. That's pretty fucking easy. That's pretty fucking, you know, 
average of what the normal person does. But when you're integrated or you're inundated with all of this shit and you have all of this, these feelings of inadequacy, right? Because that's what it boils down to. It's feelings of inadequacy. It's feelings of being left behind. That society doesn't need you, doesn't want you because you don't provide anything, but you feel you're entitled to something. That's what these guys represent, the feeling of entitlement, the feeling that she and her time belong to them, that they can just say what they want and goddamn her opinion of it. She's still there to serve them. That is sexist, misogynistic bullshit. And that is what this scene represents. And I'll tell you this, I've seen scenes like this play out in real life. Not, of course, if they're turning into a Hulk monster, but with dudes not simply getting the fucking hint and the people that are mad at this are people who are the kind who would never get the fucking hint. So it's a little bit of a, you know, you start really looking at it from that perspective. You start to kind of see there's a bit of a Venn diagram overlap there, right? You can kind of pinpoint out the problems, but let's keep going. I'm so sick of this. Like anytime there's any fucking social commentary in any comic book, anything, people fucking flip out. A certain segment of men flip out. Let's be honest. If it's by a female, if it's a female led show with a female director, with a female writer and takes any amount of swipes at men, whether that has a point or not, it has no right to bring up any of those female experiences in this female led show, female centric show with a female perspective. They're not allowed to approach it. Otherwise, it becomes woke garbage. It becomes an attack on all men in the entire universe. And they say that all, you know, all women and all men are at war. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Grow thicker skin. If it seems like your ego is hurt because they're showing catcalling and a woman gets pissed off that she's being catcalled and you take it poorly, examine yourself. Take a moment's pause. Do you really give a shit? Do you think it should be there in a female-centric show? Do you think it's okay for them to bring that up? <sighs> it's not everybody, and it's 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 just not everybody. Think they did the same shit with Superman? How would you react? Again, the only thing I care about is good characters. Okay. <laughs> the only thing that I care about anymore is good characters, good writing, good stories. I think she -Hulk, she Hulk has the potential to still be all of those things. It's episode one for Christ's sake. God, I mean, to judge the entire series on that, it, it's it's just crazy, man. Okay, but that's how some people want to run it, and you're gonna be so pissed at me, so pissed at me that I didn't hate it as much as you did. That, that the comments are going to become a complete cesspool like that. Yeah. It's disappointing. It's fucking disappointing. Yeah, he just looks tired. He just looks really fucking tired. So it's not everybody, you know. You guys do a good job with these reviews. Thank you. All right. I think we got, I think we got the idea there that Joe was going for. We get the idea. Watch through most of it. Uh, my takeaway is he's got some really solid points. I think he makes some good points there. I think he also misses some other points. I think uh, he's trying to play both sides a little bit by by bringing up The Last Jedi, bringing up Star Wars. I don't think the two necessarily overlap on that front. There's a lot that went into those stories. They're a little bit different, but I get the point he's trying to make, even if I, I do disagree with it. Uh, I, it's good on Joe to say this, to use his platform to call it out. People are obviously going to go after him for it. That, of course, is just the nature of the beast on this platform. Um, I think that, uh, again, the problem is, is that you have a group of people that do not add or contribute to society that are upset that they're being left left behind by society because they were taught that they are owed something by society when the reality of it is that particular belief structure never existed really in the first place to the extent of which they believe it. And that's very unfortunate. Now, I don't know about the fucking rest of you, but I want to go watch uh, Miss Marvel or Miss Marvel. I want to go watch the new episode of She'll occur pretty soon. 
Um, but we got a five dollar super chat here from Rational Skeptic. Thanks, man. This came in while we were while we were watching that. Uh, saying, imagine they do another Hulk solo film focused on Bruce. You also see the feminist types complain. Why isn't she Hulk good enough to get a solo film? Well, there's also a lot of rights issues surrounding that. There's a lot of issues surrounding who can, how they can do it and everything else. So it's not just that. And I think a lot of people who also follow the MCU know exactly what those rights issues are. And that's probably one of the reasons why you won't necessarily see that. But I would love to see another Hulk uh, solo film. And I would love to see uh, She-Hulk in it. I, I really do love Tatiana Maslany quite a bit. I've always enjoyed her work. Orphan Black is sensational. Uh, a truly good stuff to watch. I want to see what they do with this show. That was one episode. The episode where she gets her powers. It was technically episode eight that they merged into episode one in order to get audience caught up to speed so they can start covering the abomination storyline. And there should start being a lot more humor going forward because that episode wasn't necessarily meant to be comedic. It was actually more of a drama based storyline about how she got her powers and then learned to accept them. So perhaps it might be time to uh, to figure all that out. Now, Enterprising here says reminds me of the Ghostbusters debacle. Dude, I'm not even going to go down that pathway because like you're kind of you're I think you're wrong. And I have there's many examples to give about that. But I, I could see maybe to an extent I could see your point, but I get it anyway. Uh, so on that note, we've been on for an hour and 40. I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to wind it down. I'm going to take off. I really hope that everyone uh, out there has a great night. I did link the discord. It is pinned in the chat. Also in the video description, uh, be sure to, uh, to check it out. Uh, I will probably be on tomorrow night. It won't be a very long show only because I have a very busy, busy, very busy day on Friday, but, uh, we'll be talking about, uh, you know, She Hulk episode two. We'll be talking about a bunch of other stuff going on, obviously. So be sure uh, to uh, to hang out, and we'll talk tomorrow. Have yourself a good night, everybody. And remember, David Zaslav kind of fucking sucks, right? Kind of kind of blows ass, you know. But just smack the light, just tickle it a little bit. 130 of you here still hanging out at the end. Remember, folks, we could have prevented this if only, if only, if only we would have actually had uh, the money to buy shares. In- in AT&T, I guess. I don't fucking know. All right, everyone, go to bed. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great night.